Good morning. Good morning. Keeping Monster Rat alive. This is 95.5, 88.3 FM, Set JB Radio. And good morning and welcome to the final edition of MVO Talks. My name is Vita Wade and I'm the Acting Education Outreach Coordinator at the MVO. So this week we have had uh, an exciting journey and a journey through time looking at the past 25 years of the volcanic activity on Montserrat. We've, we've started looking at the birth of the island, we, we went on to speaking about the um, eruptions at the Sofria Hills vol volcano and yesterday we, we looked at the evolution of monitoring at the vo volcano observatory. We've had a, a number of guests from our local staff, our incredible scientific team at the MVO and technical support team and we've had a number of international guests as well so I hope you've enjo enjoyed it as much as I have and learnt um, a thing or two as well in the process. So, today um, I just want to run through, as we usually do, a little bit of the housekeeping. If you are on Facebook and you're watching us live, if you're experiencing any sort of technical difficulties, just log off and try to refresh your page and come back on. And for those of us who are listening at home on um, the radio, please feel free to call us on 491-7227. It's going to be an exciting discussion today and we have some fantastic guests on. So we're looking forward to your participation. And if you are on a WhatsApp and you'd like to send us a WhatsApp message, just call our message 164-495-2029. Now today we have in the studio former Premier Ruben T. Mead and he's a politician when back in the day when we, we had chief ministers. Um, uh, Mr. Mead was chief minister in 1996 and 1999, 2009 and 2010. He was also Premier during the period 2010 to 2014 and oftentimes on island we we, we comment that um, former Premier Mead has been the man at the helm during most of our crisis and most eruptive states of the volcano as well. So we're looking forward to an interesting conversation there. We also have in the studio um, Major Alvin Ryan, and Major Ryan is the Director of Disaster Management Coordination Agency on Montserrat and the Head of Defence Force. Uh, Major Ryan it helped, well, was helping to relocate and, and um, rehouse people into shelters, etc., during the volcanic crisis. And, um, and now the DMCA are authorizing access into Plymouth for various activities as well. We have on the line, we're pleased to have um, Dr. Richie Robinson. And Dr. Richie Robinson is a volcanologist at the Seismic Research Center UE in Trinidad and Tobago. We're so happy to have you with us. And finally, um, we have Professor Jenny Barkley. And Jenny Barkley is also a volcanologist joining us from the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom. And Jenny has been um, looking at the social impact of eruptions in several parts of the world. So we're very pleased to have um, Jenny with us. And in fact, she too has spent um, considerable time looking at the social impacts of the Sofria Hills and the eruptions on Montserrat. So we're very pleased to have all of you with us. And um, we want to get straight into the discussions. So, um, Firstly, I'm, I'm eager to, to find out, as well as I'm sure many members of the public and listening audience, is where were you um, on the 18th of July? You know, can you give us some insight as to what that day looked like for you? And I will start with former Premier Mead. Okay. Uh, on the 18th of July, it was just another regular day starting on the 18th. Later in the day, there was a funeral for one of our former teachers and principal, uh, Leslie Thomas. Moving from that, there was a church service in Long Ground where my wife was preaching. So in the evening, uh, we went to Long Ground, and then the bus driver who was living next door, Hogan, uh, actually came across, called me from the back of the church where I normally sit and said, Chief, the volcano is erupting. I said, okay, look, I mean, let's stop making jokes. 
because clearly we grew up understanding that we had a dormant volcano. It was actually taught in schools. Then he said to me, the governor is on the radio, Rose Willock is on the radio. So I said, okay, let me come next door. So I then indicated to my wife, look, I've got to go. So I asked the bus driver to give me a ride down and we, life was not the same after that because what was required now is that we set up the emergency operations center at police headquarters. We called the seismic research unit in Trinidad. We had people from Kinsale who, where the ash was, the ash started falling, uh, didn't know what was happening, so they moved into Plymouth. And then by the next day, Lloyd Lynch and two other members from the, the UE Seismic Research Center came to Montserrat and then went out into the hills. We called them the Three Musketeers. And then they told us, look, there was just a little eruption of the volcano. So in, in effect, that was the day. Uh, then after that, it was just uh, long 18 hour days. Uh, you stayed in the office, you had to do what you had to do, uh, setting up the, the, the first MVO, let's call it the MVO then, uh, which was set up just behind the new parliament buildings. And since that time, the MVO has moved four times. So this is their fifth location in Montserrat, which is their final home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting, fascinating. Um, and Major Ryan, what was your experience of that day like? Actually, um, I had just graduated from the technical college. I was working as an electrician. Um, Adrian Ryan and myself, we were doing some work um, on the ground floor of um, Mr. Ryan's supermarket. Um, I think it's called um, Emerald M um, Shamrock Mart, which was just across from the Shamrock um, um, parking lot in, in, in Plymouth. Um, it was a Tuesday. Um, I was the, the sergeant major um, of the cadet corps. I knew I would be working late, so there were no plans to um, go to training um, on that day. However, when we came out of the, the building, um, we started hearing ramblings, people were wondering, because there was this jet plane sound. Yes. People were actually wondering, since when it takes so long for a plane to pass Montserrat. So uh, eventually I heard on the radio, Defence Force um, should fall in. So as a senior member of the Cadet Corps, I went home, put on my uniform, and I, I, I came back. Um, the same evening, an, an observation post was set up, um, I think someplace in Amersham, to actually monitor the, the, the site where the, 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 the um, this team was coming out of. And the following morning, I was um, part of a team that relieved that, that, that first group, and it, it was interesting. <laughs> we went up there this morning, the, the following morning. It was just black ash. I think the guys were actually underneath the, um, the, the, the Jeep. That the, um, the, the Land Rover was an open, mm -hmm. open cabin type at the time. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how it all started for, for me, certainly. Wow, wow. Um, and Dr. Robinson, um, Richie Robinson, if you're hearing us now, and I'm sure you are, I'm interested to hear what your perspective of what was. Um, what was that day like for you? What were you doing? And, and what was your first experience of the, of the uh, Sophia Hills eruption? Um, well, I, I was in Trinidad at the time. Um, be, uh, and quite interestingly, um, the head of seismic, Dr. Ahmed at the time, he was actually at a scientific conference that was being held in Port Spain, Trinidad. And he was making a presentation on the elevated seismicity we were having in Montserrat. So he was actually on that same day, make it, giving his presentation about the earthquakes that we were having prior to the thing that the eruption had then started. So um, I was a seismic and, and we got the news. I think we would have gotten the news from the equivalent of, of your, um, your emergency management agency in Montserrat that something had happened. Um, and we then quickly mobilized the team, which um, as, as Ruben said was consistent of Lloyd Lynch, I believe there were two other technicians with him who went up the next day because we realized exactly what was happening. And well, from then things just went. Um, basically how, how things would normally operate. You, you had, had had elevated seismic before, so we weren't, and, and we had had teams in Montserrat from time to time, but whether or not you were going to actually have an eruption or not was, was a question. So when it actually started, 
the, one of the first things that you do is try to get people there so that you could get um, boots on the ground and rent and monitoring and information to the government as quickly as possible. And the quickest we could get someone there was Lloyd, who's there, I think, by the next day or two. And he went into the field and confirmed what was being reported that you had some sort of phreatic stage of an eruption happening. Then it went to the next stage was another thing. So one of the things that we do quickly was to put in new stations and make sure that somebody was on the ground. So Lloyd stayed there for a time and then we started to rotate people in. So I actually physically went there, I think about two or three weeks after um, it had actually started. But on the day itself, um, yeah, I mean, I, we were in Trinidad and, and things just picked up um, and we just mobilized people and equipment and, and to respond to what was actually happening. Yes, rapid deployment and um, interesting as well. Um, now, um, Jenny, what what was your first experience of the Sophia Hills eruption of um, 18th July? Where were no, you? What were uh, you hearing? So Hello. My, my story is of the 18th of July is obviously not very interesting. I was in the UK. Uh, <laughs> my uh, very first experience of Super Hills, I didn't come out until just after the very first pyroclastic flow on the 3rd of April in 1996. Uh, but obviously, uh, what there was an awareness of was the extremely rapid and timely response that there was from Seismic Research Centre in response to that activity and that they had uh, been aware of the elevated seismicity and the, the unrest, as they call it, uh, for a while. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right. So, um, Dr. Robinson, Richie, you mentioned that there was some earthquakes before. You, you, there was There was some some sort of feeling that activity was building um you know and as pr former premier mentioned as well when i was going to school we were told too that the volcano is dormant these you know and in dormant in my mind i was just dead it's not gonna reawake but i'm wondering how much of pre-1995 were there warnings that the sophia hills volcano would erupt um you know what was the feeling like um what was the advice like um Former Premier? Well, after the eruption started, then we recognized somewhere along the line there was a watch report um, which was done sitting on the shelf. Uh, people like myself had never heard of watch, had never heard of no volcano report because I had clearly not lived in Montserrat for some time. And then we realized that approximately every 30 years or so that the volcano had elevated activities. But it, it never went beyond elevated activities. And therefore, in the initial stages, nobody really expected it to go beyond uh, three to four weeks, a month, thereabouts. Didn't expect it to get into the stage where it went into dome growing and so forth. So everything for us was brand new. So we had to create uh, ways of doing things in Munzrat. And over the years, I think the MVO has built itself into a reputable, one of the more reputable institutions internationally. Mm. And, um, and Dr. Robinson, um, you know, from your scientific perspective, what was, what was happening, you know, what was, what was being said at the SRC, um, which I believe was the SRU at the time, Seismic Research Unit, um, pre-1995, um, you know, what, were, what was the scientific community thinking in terms of, you know, could there be another eruption on Montserrat? Were there warning signs? You know, um, Vita, hindsight is a interesting thing, eh? but um, clearly before 95, the volcano had indicated that it wasn't really dead, that something could happen. It had had these 30 year cycles as, as um, Mr. Media indicated, where you'd had periods of increased seismicity. Um, so we had in the 30s, the 60s, and then I could say more or less in the 90s, we started to have something. It got, it got increasingly intense, so much so that in 1994, um, if you lived in Plymouth, you would have been hard pressed to, to think that you didn't really have something unusual going on because you had earthquakes that were being felt. And when you get to the stage where you're starting to have volcanic earthquakes being felt, you know, I mean, it's an indication that, that something could happen. Of course, 
you had these periods before. You had periods where you had a lot of earthquakes associated with super hills, and then it had not gone to an eruption. So, so to say that we knew that something could happen this time, I, I don't think we knew for sure, but we knew certainly something unusual was happening at the volcano. So that the, the, the number of stations that we had in Montserrat operating by 1995 when it erupted was much more than we had, say, two mm -hmm. years before. Because again, how you operate is that, you know, there's a long period before eruptions happen in the region, or when it get close to eruption happening, we usually intensify the monitoring. Um, so in 95, you didn't know it was, was going to erupt, but it wasn't really too un unusual. Um, and a number of things happened. Um, for example, in 95, when, when I, I actually went to Montserrat twice in 95. I had gone to Montserrat earlier in the year when the EOC had opened. The EOC had a big new building that they had made, um, that they had built, the headquarters mm. quite close to the, the police station, where the police station used to be in Plymouth. And we actually came there, a team from, from Seismic came, myself, um, William Ambe, and Jody Vine, who was a collaborator from the, U, from the US. And we actually put on a display explaining about the volcano. William went, Dr. Ambe went to various schools. He spoke to, to um, various um, chambers, various um, stakeholders in Montserrat. We actually had people came to EOC and we gave them presentations about the volcano, about the fact that you had a volcano that could erupt. We didn't mm -hmm. know it was going to erupt, but certainly we had intensified the monitoring and intensified the amount of outreach we did. Mm -hmm. um, so that in 95, when you had the phreatics, we weren't totally surprised um, that something was happening. Of course, our messaging wasn't as good as we would have liked. Clearly, people in Montserrat didn't get that message that this was not dead. Um, so that when it actually happened, they were all very surprised, in, including including the authorities, which you know, which has actually taught us a lesson. So we do a lot more in terms of outreach now. In fact, Montserrat taught us that we need to get out there and get a message out that we have volcanoes that could erupt, and there's a lot more information coming out now, which is why you know we work with people like Professor Barclay to get information out to people in various stages. That's why you have, for example, the exhibition that you have in Montreal, that that nice volcano um, mm. mountain glow on, and the website. All of that is coming out of the fact that we now realize we have to get that message out that you really have to live with this volcano. You can't ignore it. You can't say it's dormant. Mm. At some point, it, it will do things again in the future. And that it did, and that it did. So, taking the last evacuation order for Plymouth and the villages south of Montserrat, of, south of Plymouth, in um, 1996 as an example of the most significant impact of the eruption at the time, um, could you could you all explain to us what triggered this? Um, you know, what were some of the, di the difficulties you had um, in maintaining the evacuation order? And I'm, and, I'm interested particularly to hear, um, you know, from Premier, Premier Mead and, um, and Major Alvin on that. W were there any doubts at any time, you know, about how useful it was to keep Plymouth, people out of Plymouth at that time? Well, uh, let's, not, let's not start with Plymouth. Let's start with the first evacuations. Okay. The first evacuations actually started with the people in Long Round. Mm. And Long Round, Bethel area were the most evacuated uh, community in Montserrat up to that stage. Back in those days, we were saying to people, pack an overnight bag, pack your medications, pack your essential documents, because we expected you to be out for a couple of weeks or a couple mm -hmm. of days, uh, not beyond that. But by the time we got around to, to the southern part of the island, because we, we were keeping the island open mm -hmm. as far as possible, because one never anticipated uh, going to that stage. Essentially, the governor and I would go on the radio and announce an evacuation. And I can recall one night we decided, yes, there will be an evacuation tomorrow, Let's not wait until tomorrow to do the recording. Let's go to the Radio Montserrat, which at, was at Lovers Lane at the time, around midnight to do the evacuation uh, statements. When we came out of Radio Montserrat and we came back down to the main road, cars were lined off from groves all the way to Fox's Bay Turning. Uh, the fact that the governor and I were going to Radio Montserrat at that time triggered some discussion. There were no WhatsApp back mm. in those days. There were very little cell phone activity. Mm. So I said to the governor, you know, we don't really have to do much in terms of getting people moving because they really will move. In the southern part of the island, uh, which included Plymouth, 
the major issue was Gage's wall, whether or not Gage's wall will hold. So we kept monitoring it. And Dr. Ambe, for example, along with his team, uh, basically understood on a small island, you keep people at home for as long as possible. But it meant that they had to very intensely monitor the, the, the volcanic activities. So when we had to ask people to move, it was an overnight thing. I can recall when we had to move Plymouth, and let's, let's deal with Plymouth before we move south. Mm -hmm. I actually took the decision to call a few persons before the official announcement. One was cable and wireless, because clearly you needed to have the telecommunication system set up. The other one would have been the medical personnel at the hospital to get them prepared to move. And the other one would have been Mull, sorry, Munlek at the time. Mm. Because you wanted a smooth transition, you want, you, and you also wanted to allow persons who are working in those essential services the time off to be able to do things. But once the scientists said move, there was very little, if any, hesitation or too many questions being asked. I can recall at times that you'd be at home and you always kept your radio on because there's always Charlie Mike, Charlie Mike, you need to log mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And it meant that you had to be there at all times, thinking about what to do next, how to do things. The other thing is that there are some persons who are uh, not mentioned very frequently, and that would be people like the Defense Force, mm. uh, who were embodied. They were at Sturge Park. They were sleeping in the open, sleeping in a tent, sleeping in the pavilion, and they did yeoman duty. They used to be at Tar River looking at the hill every night, and I remember going up there one night, and there was one corporal who we knew was deadly afraid of the volcano. He would not sleep. He will not turn his back on the volcano. But they did their duty. People like Billy Darrow and Luke uh, were from the police service. And we had them climbing up Chances Mountain, climbing up Gage's Wall at night. One night, actually, that we couldn't retrieve them by helicopter. They had to sleep up there. And this is a kind of effort which has been made by a lot of people. So when we were asked to move St. Patrick's and people were always saying, okay, no, you, you need to move them out. And we're saying, no, we're going to keep them for as long as we possibly can. When we got the call that, look, the gauges wall may actually be in stress. We then made the call. We have to move everybody out. And people willingly moved um, in, in the main. They willingly moved and, and they came out, although nothing happened uh, initially. Uh, people still moved out once government asked them to move. The other problem would clearly have been where do you put persons because our emergency operations focus on short-term accommodation, which would be for hurricanes. We never in our wireless streams figure, one, you had to move your capital, you had to move three quarters of your population, where to put them, how to feed them, how to look after them. Mm -hmm. uh, those were all issues, and we had to learn as we went along. But we did, and the people did what they had to do. The other area is the how do you feed all these people? So we got the merchants involved. We started distributing food to whoever wanted food. And then later on, we came into a food voucher system where whoever required, whoever relocated and needed food vouchers, just draw the line and you get your food vouchers. We, no, no questions asked. The, the farmers, on the other hand, continued to farm, especially in the Farrells area. Uh, later on, we had started farms in the Trans area, which was irrigated farming. And I can recall going up to Farrells, looking at an escape route in the event that farmers needed to get out of there very quickly. And we actually cut a route going up Windy Hill, coming down through Hollander Estate, told all the farmers, don't leave, don't take your keys out of your vehicle and always park with your head out. And if you hear additional rock falls coming on the hill, do not wait for an evacuation or to get, get out of there. Unfortunately, and this was after my time, some of the farmers moved late. There are a couple who actually, without calling their names, who 
I had the pleasure of having discussions with previously, and they did the right thing. They went through the exit route, which he asked them to, and they've survived. Thank you. Um, you know, what I find fascinating, Nia, is your, your personal touch that you had, um, you know, in managing this volcano, the boots on the ground, you know, going to, to Chances Peak, going to speak to farmers, you know, going and looking and seeing and feeling what was actually happening on the ground. Um, that connection looks like a, you know, it feels like a sort of masterclass in leadership crisis. Well, the, the, the connection went a little differently, and I'll just add a little humor to this, mm. is that... I did not believe that I can monitor the volcano just listening to what the scientists were saying. So three or four times a week, I will go to Chances Peak with them, even though the mountain was still exploding. And I, I can recall at one stage, uh, having come down from the mountain, uh, Governor and myself had to do broadcasts every night, and you had to find something uh, to keep the hope and the spirit of people alive. I saw a swarm of butterflies, yellow butterflies, uh, on the mountain. So I came down and I figured I'll put it in the evening broadcast. And um, the political persons of the day, my good friend and cousin David Brand, uh, blew it up and said I was being advised by butterflies. And I then became <laughs> a butterfly scientist. Uh, but it, it was a, hands, a very hands-on approach. The, the chaps from the SRU uh, came here voluntarily. They... They were not paid. They were not salaried. So we actually hired a cook to ensure that they were fed. And we had a lot of volunteers uh, from Montserrat within the public service private sector who volunteered to come and look at the drums, uh, check the vol, what, what they would call picking, picking the earthquakes mm -hmm. uh, by just looking at the drums and reading them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, persons in Montserrat actually came through that process and volunteered and helped. So it, it was a total community effort, but again, the leadership was important. And what used to happen is that the governor and I, although we had our differences from time to time, because constitutionally, uh, disasters fell to him. But as I said to him back then, it would be rather difficult for you to say one thing to evacuate, and I said to the people, don't evacuate, who do you think they would follow? And then on, from then on, uh, we became like Batty and Po, as the Guyanese would say, you never saw us separate, uh, we never went on radio separately, and we kept to a single message. Mm -hmm. uh, so that again was important, that at the more senior level within government, that both the governor and the chief minister were on song, mm -hmm. saying the same thing, Mm -hmm. and not having arguments publicly. Yes, we had private arguments and very heated arguments, but in the main, the public never were aware of our differences. That united front, that united front, and, um, you know, it surely came through. Uh, now, Professor... Professor, Professor Robinson, um, you know, so what were the scientists saying at the time? What was the main trigger um, to call that e evacuation order uh, from a scientific perspective? Uh, I'd love to hear you know, your, your thoughts there. Um, well, the, the evacuation, the, the general rationale for calling an evacuation really is to save people's lives. So um, we would constantly operate where we try to get information about what the volcano is doing, um, which is why we monitor it closely and why we had people on the ground to, to look at what, what was, what, what, what both the remote signals from the seismometers would you know, but also physically to see what's happening. And depending on, on, on where it is, whether or not it looks like the event that is building up to or about to, to exhibit could put people in harm's way, we would advise the government that if you do it. So um, the, the, in, in Montreal in the early days, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of uncertainty. And then you have an, an eruption, there's, you're not really sure exactly what's going to happen. Um, so therefore, there is always a desire when, when you have so much uncertainty to, to really err on the side of caution and not put people in their hands way. So um, if there was anything that was happening at the time that indicated that you, you were moving from, certainly in the first part, you had a sort of a phreatic phase where you had basically just magmatized trying to come out, interacting with groundwater and causing explosions. Um, 
and that would affected that would have affected mainly villages quite close by. That's why like Long Brown and places like that, Hermitage would have been moved far at first. And then as it got to the stage where you now have magma coming out and the potential for it to get explosions which are driven by fresh material, you have the potential for it to affect a wider area. So the area that you evacuate or you move out of the way would have expanded. Um, so that, that's how you generally operate. Uh, and and, and the, the, the decision to evacuate really would have been based on trying to make sure that people are not in the way of some of the nasty things that could happen from the volcano. Thank but but one, one of the things, Richie, is that the important thing is that there was there was a meeting every night uh, with at the MVO where yeah, that you guys attended something. the non scientists that's a, the the, the, <laughs> the governor and myself would be briefed so we were always attuned to what was happening it's not that they would call us when something is happening we were mm -hmm. always there and we were always one telephone call away. Right. So, um, people, we are listening. We're we're listening to um, very interesting um, reflections here on on lessons learned and the Montserrat perspectives on the Sofia Hills volcano. And I'm encouraging you to call in if you're listening and you have a question to ask any of our guests. The telephone number for Radio ZJB is four nine one seven two two seven. You can WhatsApp us on four nine five two zero two nine. Or please just um, drop a chat, uh, a comment, or a question in our facebook live chat and we'll be happy to hear from you so um yeah let's let's keep it going and, and let's continue talking and major ryan so tell us about your experience in the field with the defense force in helping people coordinate relocations of families to shelters and and so on i think um i should start by noting the fact that i was a member of the the current corps and I, th I think it's, it's, it's worth noting that the Carib Corps did play a supporting role to mm. the Defence Force. Mm -hmm. I didn't receive a Defence Force commission until '99. Mm. Uh, it was Major Lynch who authorised me to act as a Defence Force sergeant. So I was acting in, in, in that role throughout um, mm -hmm. the, the, the activities. Um, evacuating people. Transport, um, logistics, places to take them out after it was decided uh, we are the shelters will be um, located. That wasn't so much a problem because the evacuations were voluntary. The most, the most, the most difficult part was convincing some of the folks um, to actually move, especially the, the older folks. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that two excuses, two, two common excuses they, they, they tend to typically use was that um, God wasn't going to let anything happen to them and their pot is on the fire. Now, interestingly enough, back, back in those days, um, people were still, um, quite, quite a few persons were still cooking on wood fire. Mm -hmm. So you had people around the back of the house, and the pot was actually on the fire. Now, there's no <laughs> guarantee as to what was in the pot. <laughs> but true to, true to form, the pot was always on the fire. Um, eventually, you develop techniques to try and convince them. Uh, one, one of my favorite was, um, well, maybe God sent me for you. <laughs> and then they, 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 you see them pausing. But the, the, the good thing was that it was the activities were gradual. Mm -hmm. So they got to see a, a sort of a build-up, um, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And eventually, they, they, most of them, they were, too much was too much, so they, they decided to, um, to, to move. But it, it was a very um, good experience working alongside um, the Defense Force members. They treated me as, as one of their own, like, like I said. And... Um, Eventually, I am now the commanding officer. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and Jenny, I'm interested to hear from you. So you've been studying the impacts of eruptions um, on societies in, in several different places in the world, as well as in Montserrat. As you said, you were on the ground here as early as the, um, the following year. And so... It, it, do you know of any countries where there's been this sudden displacement where the population had to readapt? And, you know, what differences do you see between them and us? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So I guess uh, it's certainly in terms of these evacuations we've just been talking about, I was around uh, working at the MBO for quite a few of them. And one of the things that we touched on is really that kind of coming together of community in, in that moment. Uh, and everyone taking responsibility, but something that Richie mentioned is dealing with that uncertainty. 
And actually, it's a common feature of volcanic eruptions. So most, you have a very uh, long-lived volcanic eruption, but most volcanic eruptions, the sort of average amount of time they go on for is six weeks or so. And really about 40% of them do that kind of roaring into life where they have a very uh, uh, abrupt start, uh, but quite a lot of them rumble on for a while. So actually kind of uh, in collaboration with um, SRC, we've been doing some work looking at some of the patterns and how what happens in the Caribbean can provide lessons elsewhere. And it's actually really common that you have these situations where people are having to make really difficult decisions about their livelihoods in the face of a long lived eruption. And that actually the volcano does something a bit bigger after it's already been erupting for a while. So there's some very powerful lessons in terms of how the community coped uh, and some of the things that weren't done in succession. And it's also inspired Richie and I, uh, sorry, Professor Robertson and I have been looking uh, more um, recently back at the archives uh, here and in, in the Caribbean and in the UK at some of the lessons that should have been learned by the UK government uh, from earlier eruptions elsewhere in the Caribbean as well. So my real hope is that we do take a really critical look, look back, but also really critically look at what we're doing to try and make sure that the next community that's impacted by this and has to cope with this kind of uncertainty uh, does better. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, um, Professor Robinson, you, um, I believe, are sort of Vincentian from birth, if I'm correct. And I know in, in St. Vincent there is a volcano um, that, you know, is, is pretty much quiet. And Safria Hills volcano is active, but we don't have the explosions. We don't have the dome growth. Um, and it's interesting to hear from your perspective, what are some of those difficulties um, that we experience in monitoring the volcano um, in these types of circumstances. But stick a pin right there because we've got a caller and I'm interested to hear what that caller has to say. Welcome to MVA Talks, caller. Go ahead. Uh, uh, good afternoon. I always like to identify who I am. I'm just in New York Castle. And especially the number one Montreal leader is in the studio at the moment, retired, unfortunately, so early. I would like to ask him to explain to the public, because on a program on Tuesday night, I refer to him as the butterfly scientist. I want him to explain to the, to the public how he acquired that name. I think he had to do with regrowth of the vegetation. I don't know how to kind of give him a lead sentence here. So I'd like him to explain how he acquired the name butterfly scientist. Thank you very much. Well, I, I actually, I had mentioned that uh, previously. Uh, clearly, you were not look, listening at the time, but I'll go through it very quickly. Uh, going to the volcano pretty much three to four days a week uh, with Dr. Ambe and his team and having to go on radio every night, basically keeping people quiet and people then calm. One, one day we went up and when... When we went up, there was a swarm of yellow butterflies hovering at Chances Peak. And I came back down and I used it in the evening broadcast. And my good friend David Brand, who was then opposition leader, opposition member at the time, then used it as a political joke, calling me the butterfly scientist, because, as he said, I was taking advice from butterflies. So there you have it. So you have it, uh, Mr. Justin Hero Castle. Um, and so, yeah, back to you, Professor Robinson. And um, you, you were talking a little bit about the difficulties in monitoring the volcano, advising government and informing the population when you have a volcano that is active, but we, we don't see the eruptions. We're not seeing the pyroclastic flaws and the dome growth. Go ahead. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's in the region, in the Caribbean region, we, we, we are... We are blessed, and I guess to a certain extent, not so blessed by having volcanoes that don't erupt very often. So, which means that you could live here for a lot of your life and you don't ever experience an eruption, and therefore your perception is that the volcanoes are really very peaceful and not harmful at all. So, monitoring them in that situation and keeping people um, on the guard for them is usually a challenge. Um, but because of the fact that at Seismic, the agency that is responsible for doing that in the English-speaking Eastern Caribbean. We've been doing it for a long time. We, we, we certainly 
you know, we have developed ways in which we do it. I mean, the main thing really is to keep a network of stations um, that at least you know when things have moved from a stage where it's sort of background to some elevated stage. Um, and certainly, as I said before, one of the things that Mantra has taught us to, to invest heavily in is ongoing education, public education, getting information to the public that these things are things that we have to, systems that we have to live with, but that from time to time they could they could erupt and they could pose harm and making sure that people are aware of that. And and as, as Professor Barclay said, working on the historical record to find out what lessons we can learn from the past and making sure that we try, we don't repeat them, um, or at least we inform the people in the region, share that message with them so that they know what, how they have dealt with them in the past. So it's an ongoing challenge. Um, in, in the case of St. Vincent that you mentioned, um, because the fact that St. Vincent is one of the more active systems in the region, St. Vincent have had at least one exclusive eruption every 100 years for the last, well, for as long as people have lived in St. Vincent, essentially. Mm -hmm. So if you ask an even extension, unlike Monstrat before 95, if you ask an even extension about Souffre in St. Vincent, they will tell you it is not dead. They will tell you that it could erupt and that they will tell you that they, they either they, they themselves or their their parents or their grandparents, somebody have experienced some aspect of an eruption and therefore they take it a lot seriously. Um, certainly if the mountains start rumbling, they would, they would do the sensible thing, which is move off the mountain and head south. Um, so it's not, in the case of St. Vincent, it's not that difficult to keep people aware and informed and, and sort of at a level of preparedness for the volcano. It becomes more challenging in places where you have had no eruption. For example, Monstra before 95, um, St. Lucia, St. Um, Dominica, all of the other islands that have one volcano, mm -hmm. at least one that can erupt, is more challenging because people haven't experienced it. Um, and, and finally, if we, if we look at one of the things that Monstrat could teach, teach the rest of the region is, is what a volcano can do. And I think one of the lessons from Monstrat is really to the rest of the Caribbean that volcanoes do erupt, even though they look very peaceful and benign and, and they're, they're fantastic places to live on. Um, and if they erupt, they can have tremendous um, impact and therefore we have to prepare for the possibility of them eruption. That's certainly something that Monstrat is a living um, example of and how to deal with it. Really. Thank you. Thank you. And um, from a disaster management perspective, um, Major Ryan, you know, what, are you, what do you see as some of the difficulties, what are some of the challenges in... Um, you know, advising, informing the public in regards to, you know, the risk that we still face? Well, it's, it's not so much a, of a difficulty, um, but as I said, um, part of the lessons learned is that we do realize that we, we do need to get that information out there um, for, for the folks and have it constant. And in that light, we do have a dedicated information outreach officer at the department, um, Shailen Quilly, who does a fantastic job, if I might say, um, in, in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. So it is just to constantly remind folks that the volcano it is still there and well we're into the hurricane season. But as, like I, I like to say, you keep both eyes open because mm -hmm. we deal with all hazards. Mm -hmm. And um, and Jenny, interesting to hear from you as well, your perspective in, in, in terms of those challenges and keeping people informed. You've done a tremendous amount of work on the education and outreach, especially most recently on the Disaster Pass project. But if we, before I get to you, one minute, because we have some caller on the radio. Envia Talks, welcome. Go ahead, caller. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, Julian Romeo. Good morning, sir. Go ahead. I was, I was listening to the yellow butters, the butterflies thing, and uh, I want to say publicly, uh, Mr. Yes, Mead, I want to say publicly with Mr. Mead being present, the ex-premier, that he was criticized heavily for the butterfly comment. The truth is that had he not been that positive during those times, all of us would have been in Birmingham by now, and we would have been just probably a military base here in Montserrat. Mm -hmm. Had it not been very positive about what went on and what he saw at the time, we definitely would not be here in Montserrat. I, I believe one of, the, one of the problems that we've had over that during that time is that 
what should have happened if a lot more people went up in the, heli- in the helicopter and saw exactly what Ambi and Ruben T. Mead and other people were saying. Mm. It would have been much better understood that it was like, you know, throwing porridge on the top of a mountain and and the porridge running down the flanks of the of the of the mountain. We didn't understand because there was one week I remember during after July eighteen. We went up into Tar River to look at the flow that was coming down Tar River. I mean when you think back back at it you, 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 you it makes the hair and your your hands stand up because what happened? The danger that we never really understood. Mm-hmm. But like I said, if you if we had the perspective that the scientists and Mr. Mead had, if you went up in the helicopter and really saw it, you realize that on the north end was as safe as anywhere else. So um, for Mr. Mead, I give him credit for um, had it not been for him and the yellow butterflies and the positive thing that he said, um, we would have been in Birmingham. And, Thank and, you. And Vita, if, if, if I may, from a personal perspective, um, I tend to be military-minded, so I'm apolitical. Mm-hmm. But I've always took that statement to mean as a message of hope. Mm-hmm. Remember, um, in, in, during those days, people were worrying about the, the gas, the ash. As, as a matter of fact, there, there were several studies Throughout the um, throughout the years, as to what effects the ash um, had on the mm-hmm. uh, population. So, from a personal perspective, I took it as a, a message of hope. Mm-hmm. Yes. But if, if I may, in responding to Julian, there was there was a point in time when the British basically were trying to get all of us soft months right, and that's that's a fact. There was the Camp Lightfoot situation in, in Antigua. There was also the situation where. A colleague, prime minister of mine from Barbados, who unfortunately is in hospital now as a retired prime minister, Owen Arthur, called me and said, Ruben, I just got a call from the British government and we have agreed to accept a thousand persons here in in Barbados. And a similar call has gone to all the other heads where they're trying to farm months rations out across the Caribbean to as far as Belize. I then called the Secretary General of CARICOM, who happened to have been on a trip in Africa. And I said to him, we are colleagues and friends, because quite a number of us are graduates of UWI Mona and may have been at Mona around the same time. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, there's no such call by the people of Montserrat. The people of Montserrat will not be moving from Montserrat like that. We're not going into Camp Lightfoot. We're not going to the other territories unless people want to go there voluntarily. What the British need to do is that we are British citizens and we must be treated as such. And therefore, allow us to go to the UK uh, for those who wish to go. At that particular point in time, I said government will not be paying for anyone to go to the UK. If they wish to go, they can go other than persons who who really needed to go. Uh, We provided assistance to a couple of those. But there were a couple of us, um, City John was one of them, who said categorically, we will not be leaving Montserrat, we will not abandon this country, Montserrat will not be a military base. Fortunately, the British government eventually succumbed and allowed Montserratians to go to the UK uh, getting the full benefits in the UK. So mm-hmm. it, it was a fight, but they eventually conceded and agreed. But had we not stood up to them, Montserrat would have been pretty much a base for the management of the volcano and possibly a military base. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. And, um, you know, that song comes to mind um, from Pops Morris. Thank you for holding on. And, um, you know, so many of us wouldn't have the opportunities today that we have on Montserrat, you know, had it not been for that decision for us to bind together as a community and deal with whatever the circumstances would be and rise above it. And to do that took leadership. Yeah. And for the, for you, Before like you say, bring Jenny in, can I just Go mention ahead. a couple of things? I think they're, they're important as a lesson going forward. Mm. When we approached the British government for housing at the time, they said no. Uh, they ring fence five million pounds to relocate people off Montserrat, and I said, I am not going to accept it. 
but they said they will keep it ring fence. So I said, look, if you really want to show that you're supporting Munsrat, and we're looking at the Wadge report, the Wadge report said anything north of the secondary school was safe and people can, can remain here. When they insisted on, on not providing assistance, I actually went to the Caribbean Development Bank. I went to the, my colleague heads of the overseas territories. Each of the overseas territories gave me $40,000 to build a housing unit. Uh, back then, we were building T111 uh, temporary units. CDB, in a meeting in Guadeloupe, said to me, Ruben, we, amongst your colleagues here, have decided to give you a million dollars left over from the BNTF, but you know you cannot use it. Uh, uh, it will not be dispersed immediately. I said, all I need is your approval in writing that the funds are available. I know the rules of the game. By the time you disperse the money, I would have spent all of it. And that is how we ended up with the family units uh, located across Munsrat, uh, starting a housing program. Within any situation like this, yes, people will claim government could have done more, more in terms of housing, etc. But today, and as I was saying to Major Ryan uh, before we started the program, we don't have to worry too much about hurricane shelters in Munsrat. Because subsequent to the volcanic eruption, through government programs, we have had some very good housing built in Munsrat, including Lookout, uh, which, which was started during David Brand's time, which all of those houses, other than the prefabricated houses, which we fought against, uh, are hurricane resistant. People have now built houses of very good quality with concrete roofs and are sufficiently uh, robust that very, very few people will need to go into shelters. Mm -hmm. And we have to continue that housing development. And I think the people of Munsrat must be commended for remaining and working so hard, or CARICOM brothers and sisters who came despite the volcano to assist us in rebuilding. Thank you, correct. And um, Dr. Barclay, uh, so your perspective in terms of, you know, the, the informing people in these circumstances <laughs> where we are, we're, we're active, but we're very quiet. You know, what, what perspective and advice do you have to give in terms of lessons there? I think it, it comes back to some of the, it kind of touches on what we're hearing about here, which is trying to make decisions based on incomplete or partial scientific knowledge or, or where things are very uncertain. And I think the tactic that has always been taken by the MBO, which is to give out as much information as possible. And the, the caller also referred to the idea that what we have to see is we have to be able to see it for ourselves. And I think that was something that MBO did right from the beginning through the running of the eruption. And I think in a moment of, of quietness, as you have now, where the volcano is still active, the same really applies, that we have to kind of help people uh, understand what it is that we're facing and not try to hide the uncertainty or hide behind the uncertainty to make bad political decisions, for example. So it's trying to kind of help people visualize what's going on. And one of the really big challenges has always been the fact that before the volcano does something, it's doing an awful lot under the ground that we can't actually see. And that's one of the really big challenges. But I think kind of looking back, you know, the Montserrat Volcano Observatory was one of the first volcano observatories in the world, I think, is that right, Richie, that was publishing its daily reports on the website every day so that people all over the world who wanted to catch up with what was going on, the government information unit came in. I remember Dave Williams and his giant camera mm -hmm. filming things so that they could put it on television and let people see this. And that's the most important thing to do with the uncertainty is to kind of share it. And um, thank you for that. And before we, we, we get ready to close, um, Jen, you, you, you made mention to, um, you know, lessons that, you would have liked to see the UK government having, having learned. And uh, I was interested to hear a little bit more in terms of what, what lessons you know, were you thinking? Um, can you share a little bit more insight on that? So, I, well, one of the things, and I, and, I, and I think that we've heard about this in, the, in having both eyes open, there's a huge distinction between a volcanic eruption and a hurricane, uh, but in the Caribbean, one should expect both. 
and with a volcanic eruption it could go on for a long amount of time and that politicians and decision makers need to prepare for the long haul. I do wonder whether in the Caribbean you may be doing a little bit better with COVID than us in the UK because you're used to these kind of long-term um, challenges. And I think certainly the thing that we saw uh, for the UK government in how they dealt with the eruption on St Vincent and then the memory coming through into Montserrat, they used the uncertainty as an excuse to do nothing. And in the face of volcanic unrest, there's not an option. And the science is incredibly important. And that kind of close relationship that um, Mr. Mead was describing earlier between the scientists and the politicians so they could understand what was going on is incredibly important. And the scientists are a very strong part of the kind of aid program, almost, if you like, in the event of an emergency. And I think that's something that people don't learn about volcanoes. So you should really value your wonderful monitoring agencies in the Caribbean. <laughs> that's my main message. OK, so um, we have we're, we're coming up to the end and we and we're going to have to close the conversation now. And it's a conversation that we could have, you know, had for hours. Um, you know, and, and what I'm taking away here is that community and collaboration has brought us this far strong leadership and and um you know that volunteer support that that spirit to survive um and work together now that he's brought us this far 25 years later um how can we all work together collaboratively as a community um to to take us into the next 25 years um you know this this next period of what the activity might be we don't know but as we continue to recover and we develop from crisis and disaster um i would really like to hear from each of you to close um you know we we probably have a minute each as to um you know how do you see your roles together um you know working as we 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 forge our way forward how can you continue to collaborate? Are oh, you going to start with Richie? And, and I'll, I'll and speak. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with um, Professor Robinson, and then we'll we'll go straight round. Yes, I mean, I could, I could probably take many minutes to talk about that, but I mean, I think the key thing is for us to make sure that, as Jenny said, that we have a group of people. There's a need in this region for us to have a group of people who are, have the the knowledge and the capacity to provide a response to and keep on monitoring these systems that. Don't do very much for a long time, but when to do something, we need to respond rapidly. Um, we need to be able to utilize the resources both within the region and at Seismic, we work very, very good collaboratively with, with, with people from all over the world, including particularly in the UK, uh, Professor Bay Park is one of them, to make sure that we grow that knowledge, we exchange that knowledge, we make sure that we're always in the front in terms of understanding what these systems are doing. And also we work, we need to continue to work very closely with communities that are at risk to make sure that they get the information that they need, that they are aware of what they need to do and how to live with these systems, these volcanoes peacefully. Um, and if we do that, I think we're in a better stage, certainly for dealing with the future, um, you know, building regional capacity to do what we're doing quite well and making sure that that, that knowledge extends to the community. I think that's, that's, a, that's a key thing, I think, for me. Thank you. And former Premier Mead. No, I thought we were going to Professor Bartley and then. Okay, we, okay we, we can do that. Prof Professor Bartley, um, Dr. Bartley, go ahead. Yeah, How do you see our roles, our collaborative et efforts continuing as we, we look at redeveloping yeah. and recovering? So I think uh, most of the uh, eruption of the Super Hills has been a very good collaboration between different organisations and obviously when you're external, I think one of the things that we need to really uh, focus on and where it worked really well is where we listen uh, to what uh, the needs are in, in, in the country that's experiencing the eruptions in order to kind of try and help that collaboration as much as possible. Listening. That's my key word. Thank you. Well, from a disaster management perspective, um, I think it's important to build on the legacy of people like Frankie Michael and um, Captain Horatio Truitt, which I, I think I, it, it always runs the risk of mentioning names, but I don't think anybody would take issue with me mentioning those um, two, two names who have been uh, very pivotal in um, disaster management in, in Montserrat. So it's all a matter of building on that legacy. And I think it was during Captain Truitt's time 
that we changed the name um, to the Disaster Management and Coordination Agency. And is, is that word, I, I find, it, it is, is a very um, important one. Monsat is small enough for us to fit as much people around the table as possible for us to put our heads together to solve a, a particular problem or to deal with um, a particular threat. And I think that's, that's part of our, th our, our strength. And going forward as well, like I mentioned earlier, about the information and outreach, the, the, the constantness um, of it, and that we intend to, um, we intend to continue that. Um, prior to the, to, to the volcano, um, the EOC, as it was known um, then, consisted, consisted of one person. Now we are at, I think, about nine, so that, that, that shows the importance that we, we place uh, in terms of um, disaster management. And before I, I, I forget, I would like to commend my team, who has been doing a, a, a very good job so far. Um, you, you spoke about collaboration. Even the issue of um, entering the exclusion zone requires, um, is a trifecta of, um, of agencies that, that's involved with that. The applications come directly um, to, the, to, to myself, but Astrid Wade is the officer directly charged from the department to, to deal with that, and he has been doing a very effective job. So it's, it's the DMCA, the police, from a security law um, perspective, and of course the MVO, who does the monitoring and, and, and the scientific advice in terms of the safety of going, going into to the zone. So I, I think we have been collaborating. I think going forward, we will we, we'll continue um, to collaborate. Um, what is required now is for us to remain vigilant and the whole idea of preparation, um, mitigation. And part of, um, of, our, of our resilience is the fact that we, we do have a, a pretty robust building code. And even in, in the spirit of, of um, hurricane, we, we, you know, in the hurricane season, we are grappling with the issues of, of shelters. And if going forward we were to continue to build our homes, there, there would be less need um, the less need for, for, for shelters. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, as, as you rightfully said, it has to be a collaborative effort. No entity could be operating in, in, in silo, and I think that is the main lesson that, 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 that we, are, we, are, we were taught. Because sometimes you, 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 you recognize the lesson, um, but you, you don't actually learn it. So I, I think we, have, we actually have learned that lesson, that we need to continue to work together, and, and we, have, we have been doing that. And we'll continue to do that, do that um, going forward. I've always believed in the idea of teamwork. So that's, yeah. Yeah, just, just, just to close very briefly. Um, when the MVO started um, in its initial stages, uh, yes, it was led by the SRU. But we also had collaboration from the British Geological Society and also from the US Geological Society. Uh, and also Brown University, uh, who were who were on the ground with us from the very beginning. So that collaboration helped. Uh, there's a lot of technology that was developed in Montserrat in terms of monitoring mechanisms and so forth. But critical in, in all of this are our voluntary organizations, our people, because without them, irrespective of what government does, government can do it alone. The Defense Force has always been there. They've done yeoman service. They've put their lives at risk. Uh, when we needed any form of assistance, all I had to do was to call, uh, didn't even have to go to Major Lynch. I called Sergeant Major or Sergeant Raphael Lee. And they provided the support. They said, Chief, anything you want, just call us. And, and that, that is what was happening amongst us. When we had to feed the scientists, we got a cook in. She did yeoman work there in terms of that. When we had to feed people in the shelters, you had civil servants who went home at 2 o'clock in the morning and had to get up to go back to work at 8 o'clock. And they did not complain. Uh, the community leaders were critical in all of this. And as we move forward, uh, one of the things which I'll say, especially in now in relation to our management of the hurricanes is that the, the despite the fact that the constitution says that the governor is responsible for one of the things is that the governors are visitors to our country and many of them have never been through a hurricane they've never been through a major disaster 
and therefore they must recognize that they are not the end all and they have to work very collaboratively with the political leaders and the community leaders in terms of coming to decisions. But Montserrat, I think, has taught much larger countries how we can handle evacuating an entire city and uh, evacuating your capital and doing it smoothly without loss of life. The unfortunate loss of life uh, that happened in 1997 was because people did not follow the rules. Let's put it very bluntly. People were not supposed to be where they were not. And therefore, they died as a consequence of decisions which they made. Yes, some of them wanted to go home and be private. Yes, farmers wanted to go and harvest their crops, which, which they had to do. But we must always remember, even within this COVID uh, situation, that when the authorities are saying, let us do things together and let's do things properly, let's stop complaining and just collaborate and work to the betterment of our country and our betterment of the peoples. Thank you so much. And on that note, we have run out of time. Thank you to all of our followers, all of our listeners for this week of NVO Talks. It's been my absolute pleasure being your moderator for this um, series of talks. And um, thank you. Thank you so much to our community, to our leaders, to our scientific team, to all of our friends and collaborators from around the world who have helped us and supported us through through these past 25 years. Remember the Sofia Hills Volcano 25 conference, which unfortunately could not happen this year due to the ongoing pandemic, will now be held in 2021. And I promised that I would release the new date for this conference. And true to my word, 12th to the 16th of July 2021 is when you could look forward to all being things being being um, clear, hopefully, with the pandemic, we will hopefully see you on island and um, be able to show you some warm and true monstration hospitality. So 12th to the 16th of July 2021 is the next scientific conference for the MVO. Um, on Montserrat. Thank you again to the Office of the Premier, the GIU and their fantastic technical team, Radio ZJB, Mac and the Seismic Research Center in Trinidad and Tobago. My name is Vita Wade, and until next time, for MVO Talks, goodbye. Keeping Montserrat alive. This is 95.5, 88.3 FM, FM ZJB Radio. Keeping Montserrat alive. This is 95.5, 88.3 FM ZJB Radio. With 5,000 watts of FM power, this is ZJB Radio from Montserrat.